Thank you for tuning in to uh, one of the best shows I think that we've had so far as far as uh, new information and uh, unique information. There's not a lot of people talking about it out there. And uh, we have um, this show that's coming up is Regenerative Farming with Vernon Stout. Vernon is uh, a gentleman that you'll be introduced to in this next video. I am coming on to make an apology because uh, through de technical difficulty and an SD card that we had that recorded my video will not be part of the show. Uh, my audio worked and it came out great. So we have all the content and what we're going to try to do is I'm apologizing for that right now and you'll see that every, at least at some points when I'm uh, talking and we're having the conversation that uh, Courtney, uh, my guru, will be able to add content in their uh, stock photos or whatever that addresses some of the stuff we're talking about. But I, I just want to do that because it is a little unique. After I viewed it, I thought, oh, we don't need to give an introduction or tell why it didn't work. But yeah, that's you leave it to me to download. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think I either pulled the card out too soon, possibly deleted it before then. For that, I'm sorry. But the full content is here with Vernon. And uh, we're going to have him back for a couple of reasons. Anyway, enjoy the show. And... Uh, Please give me your feedback on the content, and if you think we did a good job patching it. Anyway, thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Welcome to the Justin Johnson Show. I'm Justin Johnson. I'm a commercial real estate broker. Uh, I've been selling and leasing properties in Utah, Salt Lake, Utah County for the last 28 years, almost 29 years. And uh, I am aware that in this social media world that we live in, uh, there's a lot of problems. We identify problems. Man, you turn it on and you see right now everything from Ukraine to Israel to turbulence around the world. There's a lot of uh, separation, a lot of uh, uh, really strong opinions, things that I would not have seen, you know, happen in the United States even 10 years ago with this Hamas and Israel. And it, man, it can divide people really quickly. It's like, what are you talking about? You're saying, right? So, this podcast, of course, was founded upon real estate, simple yeah. real estate. And, but we're uh, intrigued because what we want to pull out of real estate is the, uh, uh, you drive up and down any freeway, any roads, every property is being managed or inhabited, occupied. Maybe, uh, maybe it's investor owned. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, somebody's managing that property or they're not. And it's going right. into K status. And so, that is what our show is about. We want to talk to the people behind that. And I guess for my, you know, I brought up the problems of the world. They're, those are big problems, right? And they will affect us eventually, I guess, if it keeps escalating. Um, but uh, I've become a little frustrated because I thought, you know, how do, how do I change the world, right? You, and it comes back, and there's been a lot of people that have said it way better than I can, but just start changing your corner of the world, right? Identify the problems that are around you and... and uh, Maybe it's because I'm a parent. I'm like, my kids are coming to me, right? And now they're adults and they're approaching and I'm saying, you know what? You worry about you. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. I mean, you know, I mean, there's that. Um, people do impact us, but we really can only change. And I've got friends that are, uh, I, I would say, they would say I'm a conservative. I would say, you know, which me may be Republican. And I, I'm not so Republican because there's a lot of things about the Republicans. I'm like, they can't get it together back there. It's not my party. I'm a libertarian or yeah. something. I, I, I'm a, a constitutionalist or something. You know what I mean? Like it, I, don't, I, I think that's what I'm actually registered as. The constitutionalist <laughs> yeah. party with me and seven other people in the country or something. Then I realized that it's not, you know, whatever. Anyway, the point is, um, identify a problem. Yeah. And, and it may not be something that other people would agree with is a problem, right? I mean, there's a lot of things with... Um, um, environment, uh, global warming. Uh, what's the other terms that they use? Global. Uh, uh, you know, just overall, you know, global warming, climate change. Climate change. Yeah. 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 And uh, and so and 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 here we have today, Vernon Stout. Vernon is uh, 
the gentleman that I met down on your farm, I had read in the newspaper they had posted uh, uh, an article yeah. uh, that was regenerative farming, but then they also highlighted you have uh, the Highland and, and, and what is yeah. it, Highland farm? So, so we have Highland cattle. Highland so, cattle. Yeah, so Scottish Highland cattle. And uh, we're building a regenerative farm, so we have a lot of different types of animals that we're eventually going to have on the farm. But uh, the name of the farm is Fold of Liberty Farms. And uh, the reason we have that name is because we also have a lot of uh, military vehicles and equipment that help us protect our freedoms. And so it's uh, liberty in a multitude of ways to protect, uh, to teach about protection of freedom, but also to teach of how to help people protect their freedom personally. So how to raise food and how to, their, their food freedom. As it, that, that, that's a whole other show too. We talked yeah, about that yeah. when you were coming in. In fact, uh, today, uh, since we just met in your yeah. field that yeah. day, and I brought my grandson and my, my wife down. We were feeding, and he, yeah, he's the type of kid that just runs through the field, you know. But then he, he looked down, and there was some poop on the ground. You know, I didn't, we got a new, and he's like, whoa, what are you talking about here? You know what I mean? And he's like rubbing the faces. Anyway, he's just three, so he's yeah. a little, he's a little uh, gun shy with maybe all that, but it was, uh, it was a good time yeah. and, and fun, yeah. and it was uh, cool to go do that. Um, not knowing what you did for your daytime job, as I prepared for this, of course, I uh, reach out to artificial intelligence, AI. I got chat GPT really, you know, yeah. 3.5, 4.0. Yeah. And uh, I, so I, I, I did a couple things there. Uh, did I, I did the uh, regenerative farming. Right. And then there was a part of that that came up that was talking about the uh, carbon, sequ so carbon sequestration. Yeah. Sequestration. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that that is actually very interesting because I think that that was one little part uh, that I think a lot of people are talking about that would change everything. Right. The CO2. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, carbon sequestration is an interesting thing to talk about because you've got your uh, right and your left, you know, politically speaking. And, uh, you know, some people on the right think, well, let's just mine as much oil as we can get. And uh and burn it and everything's gonna be okay and that there isn't any you know, impact on the environment. And then on the other side of that is we shouldn't mine any oil, we shouldn't take anything out of the soil, out of the ground. I'm kind of more along the lines of in the middle, but uh, you know, what we're doing on our regenerative farm is we're actually taking that carbon that is in the air or any carbon that's available and putting it back into the soil. Uh, carbon is necessary for life. We're, we're all made of carbon and all plant, uh, all, all animal life on this planet is, is made of carbon, right? Right. And so the more carbon that we can get back into the soil, the better plants grow, the more uh, water that that soil holds, uh, the better things grow in that soil. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you look at the, uh, the soil of 200 years ago, you know, when the pioneers came to Utah or when they came across the plains, uh, the carbon content in the soil was six to eight percent, um, and now it's less than two percent, or I'm sorry, less than half a percent carbon in the soil really? because uh, that carbon is just has gone into the atmosphere. Uh, when you mix, when you till the soil, and uh, and that soil or that carbon that's in the soil comes in comes in contact with the air, then uh, it actually goes into the air. So it breaks. That down. was one of the things that I'd read that I'd never thought about. That when you go out and you see them disking and and, and tilling it up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, they do that to put, uh, well, to get the soil soft, yeah. uh, workable and also put air into it. Right. So it, that's, that's the, that's the theory. Yes. That's the theory, that's, that's right? That's why they're doing it. Yeah. And, and that's why they're doing it. And, uh, maybe it worked in the beginning when they were doing it, but at the end of the day, it's not been, a um, you know, it, not knowing maybe some of the things, but car, not only is it releasing into the atmosphere, ultimately the ground needs it. The ground needs the carbon to right. to to right. be fertile and to right. be healthy and to be strong, and uh, and and I guess um, take a step or two back. Well, and, and let me say so. Uh, <laughs> when I was talking about this artificial intelligence, you told me that what you work it. Uh, so I just found this out today. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously I didn't do a deep dive before, but what do you do for uh, uh, your so day what, job? What I do is I'm the VP of Sales for an organization called Smart Vision Works, and what we do is we create artificial intelligence uh, software and AI models uh, to look at food. So there's uh, defects in food and, and we as a culture like the best looking food. We like perfect apples, we like perfect oranges, we like perfect potatoes. 
and uh, and so a lot of the, a lot of food is grown and it is not perfect. You know, it, it has blemishes in it, and so the objective is to take the blemished food and remove it from the product stream, put the best looking food into the supermarket, and then take all the rest of that food and turn it into you know French fries or hash browns as far as potatoes or orange juice or lem uh, lemonade or whatever it is. They take all that fruit or the, that product and turn it into something else. And so the AI that we produce uh, can look at any uh, type of fr food and get rid of the, the defects and put the best product out on supermarket shelves. Yeah. We're visual people. We are. Right? We are. We, we, we use beautiful models to advertise yep. uh, clothing, glasses, cars, yep. something, nothing to even to do with what they're doing. They're just in the ads, right? I mean, we want that yep. uh, as a people. It's, it's uh, and, and hey, who, who doesn't want a perfect red shiny apple? That's right. The, the, the fascinating thing is the perfect red shiny apple might not be the one, the best one for you. Yep. And so uh, that's uh, it's it's kind of kind of funny. My my hobby, my fascination, where I want to go in life is with this regenerative agriculture, which we're going to talk a lot more about. Yeah. But uh, uh, isn't about perfect shiny food that looks like uh, the perfect thing on the shelf, but it's the perfect thing for your body. So trying to produce a product that tastes better may not look quite as good, but uh, tastes better and is better for you. So uh, that's. One of the objectives of regenerative agriculture is to is to have uh, food that is uh, locally produced and doesn't have to uh, withstand all the challenges of trucking it across the country, but rather you're able to uh, have produce and beef and chicken and eggs that have a better um, mineral, better minerals, better for you uh, and, and taste better. Uh, but their skin might be a little bit thinner and they might not look quite as good because it's not grown in one place. You know, when you go into a, um, an apple orchard that there's, you know, thousands of acres of exactly the same kind of apple or uh, thousands of acres of beans or corn or soybeans or whatever, whatever that is, yeah. uh, the, 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 the little critters that want to feed on that particular product uh, they really are well able to produce well because there's plenty of food for them. So if you get a corn worm or a corn butterfly, you know, moth, uh, it's going to find a cornfield. And if corn's grown there every single year, well, it's got plenty of food and it's going to lay eggs and lots of those bugs are going to come back. And then the farmer goes and sprays the field to try to get rid of those. And it kills all the, the, the competitors to those bugs. So now you don't have any of the things that eat those bugs. And so, you, but you do the same thing year after year after year and those bugs just get stronger and stronger in that environment and your poison gets less and less effective because, because the only ones that don't die are the ones that are a little bit immune to that particular uh, product. So, and they're immune because it's yeah. their environment, it's their thing. You know, yep. my, my father worked for the uh, federal government, Department mm -hmm. of Interior Bureau of Reclamation. And yep. uh, he, he always said, and whenever he came back from New Mexico, down kind of a Texas border, the Mexican border in that yep. area. Uh, he called it the chili pepper capital of the oh, world. Yeah. He said, yeah, he, yeah. he said, it's just amazing. You just look and it's just all these different uh, yep. peppers, right? Yep. They're being grown. Yep. And he said, it's, it's, it's a perfect environment for it, but they've got to where the harvest, you know, I don't know what they've done to maybe they start modifying the, the seeds, they start modifying yep. all the other things. Yep. And, and I guess that's what we do. We try to make things better. You know, yep. we're uh, stewards of this earth, <laughs> you know, what we're supposed to do. How yep. to, what's the right way to do that? And I, so as I brought this up and talked to people, so I actually did record a, 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 a prequel to this yeah. saying, hey, I'm going to talk about regenerative farming. Here's this stuff, because I, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to people, yeah. right? Yeah. This whole conversation. And as I brought it up to people, there was a question. So, so tell me what it is. How, how big of a plot do you have, and how can yeah. you break this up? Tell me the process that okay. you go about. Okay. So, and and also the trees. You have trees on yeah. the property, yeah. which is not normal in yeah. a, a farm, right? Well, depends on the farm, I guess. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so you know, typically you're going to take a piece of ground, you're going to plow it, you're going to make it flat, so it's easy for you to uh, run a tractor across it. You know, the bigger the tractor, the more efficient you can be. Uh, all grow, growing the same thing. It's called a monocrop. So if you're growing corn or you're growing alfalfa, you're growing beans, you're growing carrots, whatever it is, if you're growing exactly the same thing, it's super easy for you to run that, that tractor across it and harvest it all. 
But what we are doing, or what, let me give you a background of who we are and what we're doing. So yeah. 50 acres, we have a small farm. Um, our objective is to have a massive quantity of different products all growing in the same place and in fact growing on top of each other. So we're going to have uh, grass, but of, uh, not just one gra type of grass, but hundreds or you know, 40 different types of grass, uh, legumes, radishes, all kinds of different things that will put carbon into the soil, but also that uh, are, are um, uh, great forage for animals. <laughs> so, you know, the, if, if uh, a cow is eating the tops of, of radishes, that's great for them. Um, or leafy vetch, or I'm sorry, hairy vetch is another one that we don't hear a lot about. Why? Because it's not one of those things that you typically cut into hay. But cows sure do like it. And if the cows don't like it, the sheep like it, the pigs like it, the chickens like it. And so what we'll be doing is uh, uh, having at first cows go across it because cows are the pickiest. And then sheep, they're a little bit less picky. And then pigs, they are, are uh, even less picky. They'll just go and rummage around and find any. Uh, we'll talk about berries and apples and all those other things that they'll, yeah. go, they'll go and hunt down. And then uh, chickens, they'll go and spread out all the manure and, uh, and eat all the bugs. So the, the flies, you know, they lay eggs within a few minutes of the time that the, the, the poop hits the ground. And, uh, and so the next day, there's larvae crawling around in that, that cow pie. And within a couple of days, those larvae are quite, quite good size and the chickens really enjoy those. And so, you know, chickens are omnivores and they go and spread out and find every single one of those or as many as they can of those larvae and eat those larvae. It's really good for the chicken. Uh, it's the healthiest thing that a chicken can do. That's, That's the best thing, right? It's yeah. not chicken feed. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know that actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I, if I would have thought about it in the process of maybe in the old days of what they would have lived on, but, you know, I thought, I figured you just, you know, you, all, you see the, uh, Cinderella, all these other shows, they're out yeah. there feeding the birds or the chicken. Go feed yeah. the chickens, you know, and they're yeah. showing them, spreading this seed of sorts, you know, that's yeah. given out there. But as far as what makes a chicken healthy for, and you're talking chickens that produce chicken, for... Chicken, uh, to eat the chicken as well as chicken eggs, so eggers. So we're going to have 4,000 of each of them is the plan. Um, and uh, you, the, the chickens will never be in the same place twice. So they'll, they'll move every day. Uh, using chicken tractors and egg mobiles. Um, so an egg mobile is basically a, a, let's say a car frame that you built a little hen house on. And uh, at night they go into the hen house and we're gonna use AI to uh, open the door and it'll look at the chicken and go, yep, that's a chicken, not a fox. And open the door for them, let them go in for the night and keep, keep, keep predators out. Obviously you might lose a chicken occasionally to a predator. Um, and then as far as, uh, for chicken tractors, those are short sheds that literally are probably 20, 25 inches tall. So the chicken can stand up and do its thing, but it, it uh, uh, will go and hunt and peck on the ground and then the next day and it'll eat the grass and it will eat uh, the, the critters that are there, the, the bugs, the worms, anything they can find, they'll eat those. And you also have supplemental food there for them as well. So they always have plenty to eat. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of how chickens work. That's what you want chickens to do. They want to they want to scratch. They want to peck. They, that's what that's what they like. They're happy chickens. Yeah, interesting. So anyway, then the rest. Uh, in addition to all of the forage for the animals, we're going to grow trees. So we want to grow thousands of trees in a variety of different types of trees. Uh, we're going to experiment with chestnuts and hazelnuts and uh, uh, mulberries, um, apples and. Um, elderberries, all, all kinds of different trees that have a full, uh, full human diet. So you'll be able to eat, if you ate just the food that's on the farm, you would be a very healthy person. Um, so that's kind of what the objective is. And it also, uh, it drops, drops the leaves. Those leaves get composted or eaten by uh, the livestock. Um, we use something called agroforestry, which we might talk a little bit more about later, but agroforestry is where the, um, the livestock eat part of the trees. So you'll let the light livestock eat down. So when suckers come up and, and uh, instead of having to prune the bottom of your trees, you're going to have the animals just eat, eat the bottom half of the tree, <laughs> um, keep it all nice and pruned up. Uh, so it's easy to get a tractor in there to harvest. So eventually you'll need to harvest all this product and you'll be able to use traditional uh, harvesting 
machines to be able to harvest all, all those different nuts and berries. So our, our thought is uh, that you'll have one of the shakers. You go out and shake the tree, put a cascade of net underneath it, shake the tree, the nuts fall off, uh, just like the almond orchards. Uh, but instead of just almonds, where, uh, you, where everything's the same, one tree, you'd have chestnuts, and the next tree might be hazelnuts, and kind of nested underneath it, because a hazelnut tree is much smaller than a, than a chestnut tree. Chestnuts grow you know, 50 to 130 feet tall. If it's American chestnut, which there's very few of, uh, but Chinese chestnuts are you know, 50 to 75 feet tall, mm -hmm. and uh, hazelnuts are bushes, or they're you know, 30 foot tall bushes. So, uh, uh, sorry to yeah, not yeah. deviate from here. Chestnuts. I, uh -huh. uh, uh, my sister lived uh, down the street from me. We were, yeah. I, I live in the older part of Spanish Fork. Yeah. And uh, she was renting a home uh, while they were having a home built and yep. they had a chestnut tree. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, there's the Christmas song or, you know, chestnuts. Yeah. Roasting, roasting chestnuts. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that's, uh, it wasn't just here in Utah. It's, it was something that happened earlier in the, 19th or 20th century uh -huh. that uh what was it something that so, so basically what happened is uh the chinese chestnut was brought from china and it had a um i just lost the word a, a virus it's a uh not a fungus not a virus anyway it, it a, a pathogen of some sort which oh. i can't remember the name just now and it started killing the american chestnut trees because american chestnuts didn't have any immunity to that particular um in, uh, infection and uh, and basically chestnut trees started dying by the millions in fact when uh, you know Columbus arrived in the, in the Americas uh, there were more chestnuts in the United States than any other tree uh, so the, it was just covered with chestnuts and uh, obviously lots of critters ate those chestnuts um, but uh, those chestnut trees started dying by the millions and uh, a, a really strange thing happened. The government said, well, we want to get rid of oh, blight. That's the word I was looking for. We want to get rid of the blight. And so everybody cut blight. down blight. So blight is basically just a, it gets, it uh, gets on the bark and actually kills the bark on the chestnut tree. Okay. Um, and uh, it, um, they, they said, just cut them all down, cut all the chestnut trees down and that will get rid of the blight. Well, they did. And they killed all of them. Uh, in fact, up until just a couple of years ago, we believed uh, that, all, that it was an extinct tree, that there was no longer any American chestnuts left in the United States or in, in, in the world. And uh, just recently, they found a chestnut tree in the forest up in Maine uh, that was actually quite a big one, and they're starting to, they're starting to make a comeback. So we're really excited about that. Mm, that's very uh, interesting. Hopefully, those chestnut trees that are growing from the seeds are uh, able to withstand the blight. So... Cross your fingers. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, because because the, there are enough of the Chinese. It's still here. The the problem is exists, but the the blight is still very much alive. Uh, blight uh, can go in into a dormant stage for decades and uh, and just stay in the soil. And as soon as it finds a chestnut tree, it kills it uh, or grows on it. But uh, the American Chestnut Society they're working on mixing some of the genetics of the chestnut tree, so doing crossbreeding. Uh, with the Chinese chestnut and the American chestnut, so it's like 90% American chestnut and you know 10% uh, Chinese chestnut in order to get that immunity to the blight. And then this chestnut tree that's been in Maine for 100 years, uh, it's over 100 years old, and uh, obviously it hasn't died, which means that it has the immunity. So uh, potentially, potentially uh, we'll we'll get an American chestnut revolution, which would be great. Yeah, very interesting. I mean that. I'll tell you what I do think about different businesses. Farming's always been attractive until I start to hear the stories, right, of eradication of things that are just so uh, invasive species. And yeah, and uh, it's it's interesting. I, I I got an app on my phone. Picture this, I think, uh -huh. where you can yeah. take a picture of. Yep. Uh, and uh, I mean, we had uh, uh, throughout our yard, we had some nightshade uh -huh. right, that uh, I guess quite poisonous. You know. Yep. We had it growing. You know, I mean, beautiful little berry, right? Yeah. That came on it. There was that, and then I mean, but I mean, I bet seventy-five percent of everything that was in our my yard, which has been there, it's an old home, it's, and so I mean, some you know, if you clear something out, then some new things will grow up, right? It's kind yeah. of it's like wow, you know, I mean, that's there's a hundred years of planting all these different things and yeah. falling, uh, but but it was uh, invasive. So not uh, what do they call that? Not homogenous. Uh, 
native. It wasn't right. native to to this. Uh, even like the Norwegian uh, maple, I think, was uh, identified as an invasive invasive species. Spe- yeah. species. Yeah. It thrives here, but it's yep. uh, it, how it's, does it take out things? I don't know. It's it's fascinating how many invasive species there are in in Utah that were initially brought here for a reason. You know the uh, all of the Russian olive tree which is very prevalent on our property. We actually have cut down 30 acres of Russian olives, uh, and we're, we have seven acres left. That's the trees that you were able to see. Those are Russian olive trees. Well, someone brought those uh, because they were a very attractive-looking plant to somebody, and it just turns out that they grow really well here. And uh, they grow thousands of little berries. Those berries get carried away by birds, and they drop them, and then, voila, there's thousands of, of Russian olive trees. And so. Yeah, probably a million Russian olive trees in Utah that are are invasive, um, shouldn't shouldn't really be here. They thrive, but, they yeah. thrive uh, without much water or any other. Yeah, they, yeah. they seem to grow on the side of the road where there's not much else. And but but around the swamps too, right? Yeah. I mean, like, where yeah. there is a lot of water. Yeah. How, one one of the there? things that's interesting is is uh, if you can, you know, life likes to find a way, and if you find something that even may, um, if you can't get rid of it. Uh, and it wants to grow there. Sometimes it's the right thing to do is let it grow there. I don't know, I'm necessarily suggesting that with the rest of the olive trees, but um, but it, things want to grow. And so if you uh, rather than just till the ground, put something in there that wants to grow. And hmm. uh, you know, if it's if you can harvest something from it, whether it be wood or or some kind of you know produce, uh, that's that's the objective. I think from a regenerative agriculture perspective, if you can. Uh, let things grow, uh, find the things that will grow. That's one of the reasons we're uh, planting apple trees is uh, apple trees don't want to grow in Benjamin or in Lakeshore. Mm. Uh, but we're going to plant a whole bunch of them and see if any of them grow because it's possible that, uh, that one of them will grow and maybe it will taste great. And maybe one of them will grow and then one of them we can graft something onto that rootstock that tastes great. Um, but we're going to plant two or three thousand apple trees and see if any of them grow in in uh, in our farm. And uh, in worst case scenario, the pigs eat them because the pigs like apples regardless of if they're great or not. But, yeah, interesting. So yeah. so okay. So the trees that yeah. carbon sequestration. Yeah, sequestration. Yeah, sequestration. Yeah. Sequestration. I'm trying to add yeah. make a few more vowels in there that <laughs> I tra- shouldn't be. But um, as I was reading that, it was talking about the reduced tillage. Um, yeah. Increase the organic matter, yeah. st- the stuff yeah. that's coming down, and then uh, windbreak. Yeah. The- so, yeah. Uh, so we're, windbreaks are obviously very good because they uh, prevent wind erosion. Uh, you know, it's a big thing, uh, pre- protecting your farm against wind erosion. But if your farm is never uh, has bare soil, never has built bare soil, then then uh, it, it's not as critical to have windbreaks. But some trees don't do as well. Some plants don't do as well. Some of the, um, the things that you might have as forage plants don't do as well when there's lots of wind. So windbreaks are a critical component to being able to, um, you know, when wind comes across your field, it dries the field out. But if you can stop the wind, then you use less water because there's, uh, you can create these microclimates uh, where the humidity that's the aspiration from the plants actually stays there and and so it keeps the moisture which uh, reduces the amount of water that's being uh, evaporated from the soil so all of your water lasts longer uh, by building these microclimates so windbreaks are a critical part and just generally having all those trees and you said something else and i'm forgetting what it says us in carbon sequestration the trying trying to add all of that carbon back into the soil if the united states uh, I'm trying to remember the number. I think it's 10% of the United States that's currently under tilled went to uh, regenerative agriculture, like what we're trying to do. It would sequester all of the carbon that we're currently putting out of the tailpipe from uh, from cars. So I might not have that number exactly right. I don't have my notes in front of me. Yeah, but, yeah, no. Uh, but uh, uh, the point is, is sequestering carbon. You can take carbon out of the air. What do plants need in order to be able to grow? They need carbon. Yeah. And, and so plants actually grow better when there's carbon. Now, I'm not proposing that we just burn as much things as we can and, and uh, put as much carbon into the atmosphere as we can because it, obviously we can put too much carbon, but, and we're gonna run out of oil at some point, but what 
what I believe you can do with regenerative agriculture is actually utilize that carbon. You can put it back into the soil and you actually can create, uh, you know, feedstocks for, uh, for making your own biodiesels and other things. Yeah, re crazy stuff, really. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting... I started out the program saying, you know, looking to solve a problem. And, and sometimes we live in a time where we have, you know, our cell phones. Yeah. There's more information on that. You know, when they say uh, more memory than, than like all the computers of the 60s or something yeah. like that. You yeah, know? yeah. It was like, it's kind of a mind boggling thing, you know. It and is, we, for sure. And, and we've seen it progress. And, and then we got uh, big thinkers, Elon Musk, you know, making the electric car. Yeah. Um, very innovative stuff. So it's like, oh, come up with it. But I, I found, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, there are a lot of awesome things that we have been able to make life more comfortable and better. Absolutely. But I've also found that uh, a lot of times, maybe just reflecting back, right? So um, I had another show, I talked about, you know, uh, different generations as they're coming up and uh, that baby boomer, you know, uh, for years now, there's 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day kind of a mind boggling, mm -hmm. you know, that they're touring uh, the past generation. My grandparents are, uh, they've all passed away. Right. Yeah. And with yeah. them, all the knowledge that they had, right. Yeah. Uh, because it seemed outdated, not pertinent right to yeah. that. Yeah. But, uh, there's another guy I follow on one of the YouTube channels where he's talking, he's kind of an old pioneer guy. He's got a beard and he's talking, uh, I, I, I can't remember. He came out with a book. It's all the interesting things that the pioneers did to keep food, uh, preserved, like, you know, yeah. using lard and things like that. Yeah. That would, and, and it, so they cooked with lard, they used lard. They, they didn't dump their lard out, you know, like the, the, the grease out. Yeah. They did something and they made it not to just use everything. Right. I mean, that was their mentality, but at the same time, it was like, here's the preservative that come, you know, from having, uh, uh, pigs, you know, we, we ate this, we cooked this, now here's our preservative that we can cover and yeah. it doesn't really go bad. Right. So right. where I'm going with this is that I think sometimes we, uh, can be out think, right. We're, yeah. we're trying to put the best looking apple on the shelf where it may not even have the nutrients in there that we, right. That we're wanting, right. That are, right. cause our, right. we're, we're humans. We're, we've got a brain. We look at that apple. That's what I need. Right. You know, our bodies need certain nutrients. So we see that, but then we eat it and we're not fulfilled, you know, with what we're, what we really need. What we need. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and so there's a lot I just said in that a little bit. But the point is, I think, looking back at uh, maybe the way things were done. So, so is this regenerative farming? Is this how uh, people would have farmed when they first came over from England? I mean, I know that we didn't know how to farm this, you know, when we first got here, right? And the, and the Indians taught us how. It's like, yeah. you guys don't know what you're doing. You know, what are you trying? And, and they didn't. They didn't yeah. really understand it. And so uh, uh, there was, you know, different periods. And I'm... Is this what was done back then? You, you know, it seems like it would have been, but it, the reality of it, of it is, is it wasn't. Okay. Um, so the, the plow, you know, it's one of the oldest implements. It's what really changed the world. Um, and, and the most significant way of any single device in the history of the world is the plow because it allowed us to cut up the ground and plant annuals. So an annual is a, some, something you have to plant new seeds every year and it grows and gives you a nice hard seed, typically, you know, wheat, corn, um, rye, all these different uh, seeds that we think of, you know, the bread of life. The, squash and things like that, right? All, yep. all those, right? And, and squash, squash is also an annual, yep. yeah. But you plow the, you plow the ground and plant uh, an annual plant. Well, an annual is in the middle of the, of the evolutionary process. So uh, the, the annual produces a lot of food with a, um, in, a, in a fairly small portion of ground. The problem with a monocrop of annuals is that you have to till the ground, and so then you have bare, uh, bare soil. And this is what they did when they came over from England. Uh, to answer that question, you know, when everybody came from Europe, yeah. they had been tilling the ground. And... What were, where were they coming from? What were they coming from? They were coming from poverty stricken times because, you know, the king or the, yeah, the, the wealthy people weren't wealthy people weren't. They're not the ones that came over to the United States or over to the Americas. They are the, the people that came over were poor. And why were they poor? Because they the ground wasn't able to support the number of people that 
were there. Why? Because they had tilled the heck out of it, and they had been tilling it for centuries, hmm. and now the soil wasn't as good as it used to be because they consumed that carbon. They basically turned the carbon that was in the soil into food. They ate that food, didn't replenish the carbon because they didn't know how to do it. They didn't even know this was a thing. They didn't know that there's, they didn't know that there's more um, microbes and life in one handful of soil, of healthy soil, than there are people on the earth. So because they didn't know that, they just treated it like dirt. And they stepped on it and they tilled it and they didn't take good care of it. They didn't put carbon back into it and restore it to what it was or keep it how it was because they didn't know any better. Yeah. So we came, we, we, my ancestors were some of the first people to land in the United States or on the yeah. North American continent. Um, all the way back in the seven, literally in the 1700s, I know exactly who they were. Yeah. So uh, they, were the, they were the problem. And they started okay. plowing. They put the blade in the ground they right did. when they got here. They did. And they started plowing and, and, the and were growing, growing uh, annuals. And annuals were great because they yielded a lot of food. Uh, they planted it. They got this food. And, and great. Uh, the soil was, was fantastic. They grew really great. And then they said, after a few years, they went, man, this isn't doing as well. Look, there's, a, there's some more forest over there. Let's go cut it down and plant it there. Oh, look, this is growing really great. So they left the place where they originally were, and they went farther west. And eventually they went farther west. And as they went, they dug and plowed and, and used up that carbon. The carbon that had been there for a 1,000 years is now not there. You know, the grass that was on the prairies was 8 to 10 feet tall. Uh, when the when the pioneers were coming across the, the the plains in Nebraska, you know the grass was as tall or taller than what the corn now is. Um, so anyway, mind boggling actually. It, it is. Yeah. It is. They say that a man on a horse couldn't see over the top of it. Hmm. If that tells you anything. That's that's pretty tall grass. It's amazing actually, it, because it was. So, so I'm sorry. I got to divert here because go. the the questions keep coming. I thought I forget them. Um, so I was. Uh, um, I love documentaries, right? I mean, yeah. if you leave me, I'm going to be watching some documentary um, just because they're interesting to me, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, it doesn't matter where it's at in the world. I mean, there's always something that was uh, modified and changed. I know that uh, in during the depression, right? Yeah. During this difficult yeah. time, uh, at least in this documentary, I, I don't know all the facts of, if, sometimes I question if they were all accurate, right? I mean, right. the stuff that yeah. they're saying, but I understand. There, there was, they called this Dust Bowl, right? Yep. I mean, so, so yep. throughout the plains, it was like, yep. literally they, they talked about the displacement of dust that came up and then in, in New York City, yeah. during, in the gaslight at nighttime, yeah. it was like, it, I mean, during the day, they yeah. would have to run it because yep. it was like so cloudy. It, why did that happen? Uh, do you know why that yeah, happened? Yeah, I do, okay. I do, yeah. Um, basically they had tilled and tilled and tilled and they, uh, and, and, and the wind storms came across that happened to be a really dry year, uh, when it happened a couple years in a row. Um, and the wind came up and picked up, uh, feet of, well, inches of soil off of the great, off the plains and then went and deposited them all on New York and Washington, DC. In fact, that's how the, um, uh, the, I can't remember if it was the EPA or the FDA actually was formed. There was a, the president was trying to get a, uh, uh, a bill passed to protect the environment, uh, to protect, um, because they could see all this erosion happening. And the bill was on the floor to be passed. And he, they, they manipulated the timing of the bill because they said, hey, there's someone that's 200 miles out, this big dust storm is coming. And, uh, and it, it just so happened that it went black and over, and they all went and looked outside and went, there's a dust storm, we need to pass this bill. And they passed the bill, and that's how one of the um, agencies that we're dealing with today uh, came to, into being because of that, that dust storm at that time. But, uh, yeah, it was because we tilled so much. I had removed all of the cover crop. So when you remove the cover crop, you take all of the grass away, then water, you know, when, when if you have a raindrop and it goes and hits a... A uh, piece of grass what happens it splits into lots of raindrops and then kind of mists out onto the ground and then once it gets there it absorbs into the soil because it has to stay in one place because there's grass there but when it hits dirt it hits that first piece of dirt and has all the impact of that raindrop that hits the dirt and then starts to create tiny little caverns and as it goes downhill it gets bigger and bigger and erodes um, and so uh, because all they had cut down all the grass 
and tilled all the grass into the in to build it to raise monocrops, meaning you know seed crops, annuals, um, and they didn't know any better. They didn't know any better. 1930s, yep. 1920s, they didn't know any better. Um, in the 19, they, some people started to know better. It's fast, fascinating. I've read books from George Washington and uh, some of the founding fathers about how they were concerned about soil health uh, way back then. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, well, I, I I read some George Washington. I mean, where he's started to rotate crops. I yeah. mean, he, he was kind yeah. of a pioneer in some of that. He was. Uh, and and uh, well, the more I read about him, the more I I, I he's probably one of my my become elevated over the years because I was like George Washington. You know, he just looked like one an old guy, right? Yeah. And I missed all the years that he was doing. You know, yeah, the he father was... of our country. He, he, he's probably one of my greatest heroes. You know. Yeah. And uh, ins inspiration that he had in so many areas that was uh, and kept this country together. Having yeah. said that, yeah. So, yeah. So there was people that didn't understand it, but they knew what it was depleting. They, they knew what it was doing. Some yeah. people knew what it was doing. Well, the real it really took a turn for the worse after World War II. So you know it's kind of fascinating. I my hobby my hobby for you know the last couple of decades has been collecting World War II military vehicles and yeah. Yeah. equipment and learning all about um, about uh, military history. Um, but uh, it's fascinating that the World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War were all massive, had massive impacts on, on farming. Why? Because of chemicals. So after World War I, there was this massive uh, a number of chemicals that they could use and the understanding of how chemicals work to try to figure out how to synthetically put the nutrients back into the soil that they had removed from the soil. So instead of having it naturally there, they tried to do it with chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. So remove, you know, we as humans, we go, oh, we know better. Um, they removed all of the natural me method of doing that, of, of uh, managing pests, of managing uh, carbon in the soil and managing nutrients in the soil and said, we can do it. I mean, that's what we all do, right? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. We can do it. And we can do it better because we, we understand We're it. Enlightened on this, yes. Yeah. Yep. So they they started uh, putting chemical fertilizer using chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides on the soil, and uh, that didn't help the soil, but it did make yields go up. So th we've been doing this over time, and the soil has been getting worse and worse and worse over time. But we've been trying to feed these the the annuals using chemical fertilizers. So you wonder, well. How does this, is this, is this good? Is this bad? You know, what's, what, is this, you know, what's the pros and cons to this? And obviously we're all in favor of using technology, but what we have forgotten is some of the w ways that things actually work. And the more we learn about technology and the more we learn, understand the soil and the science of the soil, we actually now have an opportunity to make a bigger difference than we ever have in the past because we actually do have this technology. We talk about all the cool cars and Elon Musk and all the stuff yeah. that all, all these, these really s smart people are doing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and if we use that as an opportunity to repair the soil, I, I love our earth. I love how it looks when we go out into the forest, but what if we went and saw our, all of our fields and all of our farmland was just as beautiful as that? Um, and if you got more food off of it. We talk about feeding the world all the time. I mean, that's, that's if you read, you know, successful farming or, uh, or uh, I go into food plants all the time in my, in my occupation. Yeah. And on the wall, it always says feed the world. You know, in some way, shape or form, it's like, how do we feed the world? We're, we're, the, we're gonna solve the world food crisis. We're gonna, you know, ship millions or billions of tons of X, Y, Z from apples to oranges, to corn, to beef, to poultry, to pigs, whatever it is. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna feed the world because we have the technology and we're gonna do this Well, the reality of it is is that we can use that technology to feed the world by actually growing more per acre Corn corn's the king, right? Did you know more corn is grown in the United States than any other product by by huge I margin? So it's corn and soybeans. So hmm. most most of the um, uh, The crops or most of the farmland in the United States is either cultivated in corn or soybeans. And they, they're that. rotational crops. So, so they'll do corn one year and then soybeans the next year, or they'll do corn for a couple of years and soybeans for a couple of years. Um, but uh, by uh, the problem with that is you get the soybean bug and you get the corn bug, and those are the two things that want to live on that land. Um, and they, they, the, but 
what I, where I was going with this is that corn being the king, everybody com looks at how many calories per acre can corn produce. And if you can't beat corn, because corn feeds the world, right? Because mm -hmm. corn, corn is, corn's where, it at, where it's at. Because you get, I can't remember what the number is, but X number of thousands or millions of calories per acre. Well, if you can beat that using regenerative farming while putting carbon back into the soil and having a beautiful environment, which way would you rather go? So, yeah, exactly. And, then, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So we're, uh, we're using, uh, you know, corn. A lot of corn is used for, uh, as a feed stock for fuel, right? And a lot of corn is uh, turned into um, cow feed, cattle feed. And uh, after you do all these calculations, uh, you get back to an X number of calories. And if I would have come prepared, I would have been able to read all these off to you. But um, uh, the goal is to beat corn. Even though corn technically isn't food, we, we can talk about that for a little bit, maybe later on. But um, <laughs> What do you mean? That well, if, if you are put in a warehouse full of corn, so you had all the water you needed, and you're put in a warehouse full of corn, you would die. You'd starve to death. Uh, because uh, the, human the human body can't digest corn or utilize the nutrients in corn. Um, <laughs> the Indians, you talk about the Indians a little bit earlier, um, they actually knew how to use corn and make it so that human can digest a little portion of corn. Um, so I need to not forget to get back to this, but I'll tell you the <laughs> corn story. Um, so the, the corn, corn is interesting in that it... Uh, produces a lot of calories, but the only way that human can digest it is by mixing it with um, a lot lye, and that's how the Indians did it. So it's basically, you get the ashes from a fire, and you mix that with the corn, you soak the ash water, so you put ashes in the water, and then put the corn in it, you soak it for several days, and that breaks down the corn enough for you to be able to, uh, for the body to be able to digest a certain portion of the corn. <laughs> Interesting. So, so anyway, that's just, just an interesting thing to me. But without that, you can't get any nutrients. But even with that, you don't get the appropriate nutrients for proper brain function, for proper muscle function. Um, and so, you know, you, you grow millions and millions of acres of corn. For that, calories? For, Is that what we're doing it for then? I mean, we're doing it for calories. It's because what, what, do you, what do you do with corn? Well, you, you do three things with corn. You, uh, like 2% of it is, is consumed by humans. Uh, is that all? It's a very small number. Wow. Uh, most of it is turned into, like, I believe it's 70%. And if you quote me on that, you'll probably find that I'm off a little bit. But it's somewhere in there. Uh, it's used for um, feedstocks for, for fuel. And the remaining is for, um, uh, for cattle or for livestock. Now, uh, most of the byproducts, so when you make fuel you get alcohol out of it but after you so just any any time you ferment anything a lot of the a lot of it's left over all of that turn, gets turned into feedstock for um for animals as well hmm. so the vast majority of corn goes to feedstock for animals well what kind of animals are you feeding corn to cows and pigs right Cow, cows pigs chickens do cows will, will cows eat corn in nature Cows don't like corn. The cows prefer not to eat corn because their body doesn't digest it well, um, which is why this whole grass-fed, uh, you know, beef movement, uh, because it, the, the beef is better, it's lower in um, saturated fat, has omega-3 fats rather than saturated fats. It's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah, We, yeah. we can go into that. Well, but, all interesting um, stuff, though. Amazing, actually. But, but uh, uh, anyway, so so you've got your... You've got your uh, uh, corn that creates this huge number of calories per acre. You go, well, if we're going to feed the world, we got to beat that. We got to, we got to have that many calories per acre, right? So let's figure out how to do it. And, and, uh, the naysayers say it can't be done. And I'm out to prove that it can be. And I know that there's some other folks out there that have proven it already. I, I've got a i uh, read a lot of books from a lot of guys that have, have proven it as well. But mm. that's, what, that's one of the things we want to do on our farm is, is do it and then teach people how to do it. You know, my background for the uh, 16 years before, um, uh, before I went to work for Smart Vision Works, I was in food safety and uh, in training. So we taught food safety training 
to uh, to restaurants. That was that's what I did. But my degree was in computer science, and then I got into training. Was in training for for 16 to 20 years doing uh, online training. And so one of the things that I want to do as part of the farm is teach people how to farm in a way. You use the farm as a platform. Teach people how to farm uh, where they can grow more food in less space using less water that's better for you um, that isn't corn. So, um, but how do, we, how do we do it? If we use multiple levels of, of, of uh, so corn when in, in the May, you go out in the cornfield in May, what do you see? You oh, see a whole lot of dirt. Stock, or, oh, yeah. You see a whole lot of dirt. Yeah. There's nothing ha happening. You see, you see corn stalks that are that tall, right? Uh, June, middle of June, guess what you see? You see corn stalks that are about 20 inches tall. On the longest day of the year, June 21st, how, how tall is your corn? It's Three, maybe, maybe 25 inches tall. Okay. But they say knee, knee height, waist height. Um, but it, the 4th of July is the time where corn covers all the dirt. So the, the leaves from row one to row two come over. So now you've got the ground is finally in full shade. That's after the longest day of the year. So what are we actually trying to harvest on a farm? We're trying to harvest sunlight. Sunlight is what converts energy into sugar, and that's what actually produces food. That's what puts carbon, sequestering carbon back into the soil. It pulls the carbon out of the atmosphere, puts it in the soil, it creates nitrogen or takes nitrogen. So if it's a legume, it can take nitrogen out of the soil, or I'm sorry, out of the air, put it back into the soil so that other plants can use that nitrogen to grow. Um, but uh, if you've got your grass or your, 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 you've got grass and you've got bushes and then you've got trees, then instead of this much, you know, two inches of corn in May, You've got a tree that's already in full block, you know, all its leaves are already out in May. So you're, you've got 130 feet of trees catch, capturing sunlight and putting that into growth, into either, either uh, wood or into fruits or whatever that tree might be producing. And so what we're, we're trying to do is use as many layers as that as you can. In some cases, some, some like corn doesn't do well if you put it in the shade. But there's a lot of food products that do really well in the shade. And so we'll grow those food products in the shade. And then in the middle where the trees aren't, so our tree, where we're, what we're doing is uh, 75 feet is the distance between rows of trees. And in the middle of the rows of trees, we're going to grow things that we'll, we'll, we'll use no-till. So we'll lift up the grass, put annual seeds in there, we'll put it back down, and we'll grow uh, some annual crops in the middle of the. When you say lift the grass, what is it? literally like? Lift the grass. Cut a slice in the grass. Okay. So there's a there's a tool called a no-till drill, and what that does is it uses a blade and cuts a cuts a slice in the grass, lifts the grass up, puts a seed into there, and sets the grass back down. So that's a no-till drill. How far down is the seed? Um, you know, an inch, two inches, three inches. You can set it to different heights depending on what you're what you're growing. Um, so then, then that uh, actually keeps moisture because the grass actually has moisture in it. So you don't have to get as much water on it to get it to, um, to germinate. Um, it comes out through the grass and uh, then the grass continues to do its thing, but it grows, the, the annual will grow in the grass. It also has all the, naturally has plenty of carbon there. It has uh, the nitrogen that is from the legumes that are in that grass. So grass is not a legume, but you're going to have things like alfalfa and um, uh, bean, lots of different types of beans and things that are legumes that you'll have just as part of the, as part of the cover crop. And a definition of a cover crop is something that's always covering the soil. Um, so you're capturing all the sunlight because that's what we're doing as farmers. We're capturing soil or capturing sunlight to put that energy back into the soil and into the food that we grow. So anyway, um, that's our objective, is to grow way more calories per acre, and we think we can do it. So with, with hazelnuts, good, good uh, feedstock, the shells of hazelnuts are excellent uh, feedstock for biodiesel. So we're going to make our own biodiesel. Um, we've, we've made it already. Uh, we don't have enough 
uh, shells to make enough for all of our vehicles. But another thing that's interesting is by doing this, the average tractor, when you're doing a monocrop, growing corn, growing wheat, you're going to grow, you're going to drive across that earth five to seven times in a given season. So you've got to till it, then you've got to maybe make it flatter. So, you know, you do a deep till, then you're going to do a disc, then you're going to make it even flatter, then you're going to do the actual planting, then you're going to come back and you're going to fertilize, then you're going to come back and you're going to put pesticides on it, then you're going to come back and harvest it. So somewhere between five and seven times you're going to drive across that land. How much diesel fuel does that use? Well, it uses a bit. I looked up a, um, a number that was like a or a 1.5 gallons per acre or something like that. And if you look at the millions and millions of acres that were, that were planted, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of diesel fuel. The uh, uh, regenerative method will drive across that once or twice. You harvest it, and maybe you bale it. Uh, if it, in some some cases you might uh, basically two different types of harvesting. So that's that's the, the extent of of the times you're going to drive across that property. Uh, so saving a lot of a lot of diesel fuel in just that that one component. So. Anyway, lots, 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 lots of things. Yeah, so, so, um, well, I mean, uh, it took me a couple different directions on that, but I'm thinking at the same time, so if you have a, uh, one thing like, so, so do you have, what is the water savings, right? So, so we've had some dry years. Yeah, uh, for sure. Great Salt Lake's going to dry up. Everybody's freaked out about it. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. Is that going to happen? I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, we'll have some heavy years and we'll go, anyway, it doesn't matter. That's a whole separate thing, but. Um, we've had some dry years. People talk about, well, hey, it's not the homes that are going in; it's the farmers that are yeah, uh, that are using up all the water, using up all the water, and yeah. it's just it's just not a uh, the most efficient, right? Yeah. It's not the most efficient way to yeah. to farm, I guess, is what I've been told. And uh, so, so if you're uh, irrigating, mm -hmm. you just flood flood irrigation, flood irrigation yep. versus um, um, Sprinklers versus pivots, yeah. all different kinds of things. How much do you save yeah. by that? Is there a difference really or is it? So uh, there's, a, there's actually a big difference. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands one thing about water is water doesn't go away. So when you flood irrigate, where does the water go? Well, it goes. It goes into the ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it repopulates or replenishes the groundwater in, and, and it just keeps going down. It, gravity keeps working on it regardless of how deep it goes and it goes into the ground, goes into the walker first. So, so there's a little bit of a misnomer in, uh, in wasting water. Okay. So if you put water, um, now, no, don't, don't take this the wrong way. We need, we, where we need the water in the right places. Okay. Water high in the mountains is more valuable, more valuable than water that's at the bottom of the valley because it's got all that energy stored to bring it to the right places, right? So uh, it could, could you take water, every ounce of water from the, from the Great Salt Lake and put it in your home? Sure you could if you had enough energy to do it. Could you take all the water out of the oceans? Is water disappearing? The answer is no. But is the water in the right places? So when we talk about water conservation, we're trying to conserve it in the right places, yeah. okay? Uh, because water is just—it doesn't just disappear; it's still there. It just needs to be in the right places, right? So when it so, evaporates, so so they talk about Utah Lake yep, yep. evaporates. It, it goes yep. into into the, the into the air, into the air. The atmosphere, yep. the clouds will, and then it comes and it rains, and it will yep. rain. I mean, yeah. that that is the cycle. There's nothing yep. lost in that process. in that process. Okay. Right. So, but water conservation is energy conservation because if you, if you waste the water that's in the mountains and it's now no longer in the mountains because you used it, it's not, not in the reservoirs, then it takes energy to get it back to the mountains. And now that's sun energy or, and, and when, it, when you're using sun energy, you have to just gamble because you don't know where it's going to be deposited. It might be deposited back in the ocean. It might be deposited some other place. But anyway, kind of getting off, off point no, here. No, no, but, no. This is all on point. But uh, uh, what we're trying to do is use less water per acre of ground. And I think everybody, I think, I think everybody should be able to get behind using less water per acre of ground. 
Um, How much less is there? So, I mean, the so flood irrigation is the least effect, if effective use of water per acre of ground. So you're going to put, when, when we water, every time, I, every time I flood irrigate, it kills me. Because we put one, um, we're, we're getting one acre foot of water per hour on our property, and we might water uh, to get 20 acres of uh, anywhere from four to nine hours, depending on how things flow and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's a lot of water. You go, you put nine acre feet of water, that's a foot, or that's six inches of water on 20 acres, right? Or just under six inches of water. And did you really need to put six inches of water on there? If you're using sprinklers, you could probably do it with two inches of water into the same, in the same amount of time. So that's significant savings, right? Um, but even with uh, wheeled sprinklers, so I have a good friend that uh, works at BYU that his, his whole life is spends on figuring out ways to use less water. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked a ton about how to reduce water usage. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is putting sensors in the field. So the sprinkler only comes on when the water is, uh, when there's the moisture level in the field gets to a certain point. And every one of the sprinklers will be independently controlled. Now, there's a lot of these massive um, uh, sprinkler systems with the big pivots that are controlled, and they actually have the ability to control each individual sprinkler head and, and have the pivot only move, yeah, at the, at the appropriate times based on the amount of water that's in the soil. Um, but what we're doing is because, because we're not going to be raising monocrops, right? We're, ma we're, we're, we're raising these crops that 100 different crops all on top of each other. And not only that, but the cows are going to come one day and this other part of the field, the cows haven't been there yet. And so there's, like, there's this nice tall grass going on and that means that not, water is going to stay in the soil longer. It's not going to evaporate. It's going to micro environments right down there by the soil. It's 20 to 30 degrees cooler next to the soil than it is if there's no, if there's no grass there at all. But after the cows go and mow it down, so now instead of it being 30 inches tall, it's 8 inches tall. Well, it's going to need more water um, because that microclimate is not as great. It's a little bit warmer, uh, so, so the wind's going to catch it a little bit more. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, so we're going to need to water it more. So we're going to have sensors for each individual. Every sprinkler head is going to have its own uh, soil moisture sensor and will turn on when it's appropriate. So if the cows come along and the chickens and the pigs and they've eaten all the grass, it's going to water it more than the place that hasn't been, hasn't been uh, foraged on yet. So that's kind of one of the ways that we're going to save water. How much we're going to save, we don't know yet. Um, we actually uh, want to get a grant uh, to help have, have do some more research with that, and that's one of the projects that we're working on. But um, anyway, so, so I don't know exactly yet, but estimates are that we'll save 80% um, We'll use 80% less water uh, than than flood irrigation. Wow, so. that's huge. That's huge. That's, that's huge. huge. Uh, when you say the 80%, I mean, like you say, if you if, if you irrigate it, well, monocrop, right? See, once you once you get out of that, yeah. and you're talking about you're moving this this thing that's you know this thing, you're 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 creating where the animals, right? Yeah. Because you yeah. you need the animals. So it's, right? it's that's it's, the interesting thing about it. Is it doesn't work without the whole process. That's, that's right. It's you're doing exactly what nature did. So the bison would come across the the prairie and they would eat everything and then they would go away and they wouldn't come back for a year because they they're moving on. Yeah. We're we're gonna basically accomplish the exact same thing. When those cows and those pigs and those chickens come and they eat, you know, we don't want to eat everything. We want them to eat down to you know, four or five inches tall, 70 to 80 percent of the grass needs to go away. Uh, that actually strengthens the grass because they got it. Just like when you work out, you like break down your muscle. The plant does the exact same thing. So it gets stronger, sends roots deeper, is able to grow back faster because of that. But also it uh, when we when we do that, um, uh, it 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 changes that particular environment for the, because of those animals went were there. And they leave their they leave their manure behind. They use, they leave their urea behind. They they fertilize, and that all goes back in the soil, adding all the nutrients that the soil needs in order to be able to grow again. Very interesting. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Very, you know, it's a um, 
I, I, and I, I talked to these people, uh, you, you know, the best fertilizer, right? Yeah. And it's when I was younger, you could get uh, manure. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, there was lots of places you could go get it. We had yeah. horses and some cows. Yeah. And we would spread it in the garden and till it in, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I you know, yeah. shouldn't have been tilling it or whatever. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, using that, right? Because yeah. we didn't have the whole system. But it was, uh, it, it worked so well, right? I mean, you just, yeah. Didn't want to put too much on because it could burn, burn right? Yep. Get the stuff, right? Yep. So there's that whole process, and it's been a long time since I did it. But at the end of the day, uh, I think to duplicate that with fertilizers, you know, uh, chemical fertilizer, yep. is, is is it even, is uh, do we have fertilizers that yeah. are as good as manure at this point? Great question. So uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, the long answer is uh, there's a lot of scientists out there that believe the answer is yes. Um, you know, the chemical fertilizer, that's World War II. That's when fertilizer really became the thing is all of the things we learned during World War II to make explosives and, and uh, that, that same stuff to make fertilizer, ammonium. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, we don't have, you, you can add certain parts of the, the fertilizer we can make synthetically. But what does that do? Let's, let's use me as an example, okay? If, if I uh, uh, get brought food every single day and I never have to leave the couch and I've just got my feet up and I'm sitting there watching Netflix and I do that all day long and I just keep getting a good food supply, and am I, am I, is, it, is that good for me? No, no, no we know that. that's not yeah. good for me, right? Yeah, that's so good. It's pretty, pretty, soon, yeah. pretty soon I'm not, doing, I'm not able to stand up and, and I'm not healthy. Well, when you bring to the plants a continual supply of synthetic fertilizer, that's doing the exact same thing that you're doing to yourself if, all, if someone brings you food every day on the couch and you never get up because you're just, you're just sitting there getting fed. So then when trials happen, which, you know, be it, be it drought or you didn't get enough fertilizer that day, there's no way for that plant to recover. So that plant is, in a nutshell, really weak. Um, and it doesn't have any way to recover from hardship. So, you know, if it's whatever that hardship might be. Um, but when you force it to grow and make its own fertilizer because it's putting down its own roots and it's building a whole symbiotic relationship with all of the other billions of microorganisms that are in the soil that actually create the ability for the plant to uh, metabolize all the natural minerals that are there and the break the breaking down of other plants that are next to it and uh, all of a sudden it's generating its own fertilizer because it's learning how to grow and build uh, its own systems and all of those systems that are you know there's things that called micro microphysal run can't say it fungi mycorrhizal fungi um, and uh, uh, things that are in the soil. Basically what those are is they're like these giant antennas. You've seen, uh, if you ever looked at like a bug under a microscope and all its antennas that are just like lots and lots of them, that's what it looks like. And there's billions of those all over through the soil. And those uh, actually are what uh, and enable a plant to digest food. Well, when you just give it um, synthetic fertilizer, it doesn't allow those micro rhizal fungi to exist properly or to grow and to become, um, uh, have a high enough population density to actually help the plant to grow properly. So what you're actually doing is you're hurting the plant overall by fertilizing it. What would be a better thing to do is to plant multiple different species of plant in the same place where one plant actually bring, pulls nitrogen out of the air, puts it into the soil, that's the legume, and then uh, and then that breaks down, it dies, and then the mycorrhizal fungi change the molecular structure of that, and the new plant then sucks that up and uses that to grow. So that's just one tiny, one example, and there's billions of those types of examples that are happening all the time. Okay, that, uh, you, uh, you've been we've been talking about dirt the whole time, one way or the other, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so wh whatever reason it didn't pop in my head, um, but, uh, I, I, I was listening, I can't remember what book it was, uh, but it was, um, about the native, native American, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, yeah. when we came here and they were talking about the Amazon, right? Yeah. The Terra Preta, 
Uh-huh. Uh, the black, the black dirt. dirt. Yep. Black earth or whatever, you yeah. know, they, yeah. and, 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 uh, and they've now come, you know, several things out of that, which is very interesting, right? It's a very jungle. Uh, I mean, it's right there, you know, where, where that whole Amazon's right there near the equator yep. and, and, and slash and burn or, you know, some of these things that they've done in different areas. Right. But they've now figured out because it, it has pottery in it. It has a uh, human fecal or whatever, yep. you know, yep. some other things that the Brazilian walnut was not native to that area, okay. but it's throughout the whole Brazilian, you know, and this, this dirt was manufactured essentially, yes. right? Yep. Now I, I say manufactured, they understood this process. They I, did. So I'm maybe did. deviating. Am I getting way off well, by I, bringing I, this up? No, this is, this is exactly what we want to try to do. I mean, okay. so it's, it's dirt that is uh, supposedly, uh, if you can get it, and introduce it even into other soils, it will kind of take a life of its own and keep, and, and change an area. Yeah. Now, but, but they don't necessarily know how to um, uh, remanufacture it. And 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 a lot of these, uh, for lack of a better word, Native Americans that, that were living in that area, the Amazonian yeah. people. Yeah. Um, a couple things now with the lidar and all that other. There was a thriving community there, right? Yeah. Millions, yeah. you know, well, you know, they, they were tra traveling down. Some of the initial ones were like, these cities had millions and millions of people, like, right. Yeah. And, and right very here. prosperous. And, uh, and then, you know, they go back and maybe, you know, in that little time period, smallpox, who knows what, took, took, took out a lot of people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lost knowledge of, of these people. But uh, they're, they're pretty, at least in the book that I was reading, and I think I've, ref I've heard a lot of discussion of it, right? There, I think there's a, 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 a <clears throat> A thing happening in the world, right? Where it's it's kind of coming down to basics. That's why I yeah. kind of wanted to point that out in this yeah. in this video is that um, maybe we don't know that. You know, I was a little surprised when you said we put the blade in the ground right out with the the revolutionary uh, colonizing of America. But I knew that actually, if I would have thought about it, right? Because yeah. that's what they were doing. That yeah. is what changed the whole farming thing and and exhausted the soil. I didn't I didn't necessarily think I would have always thought that that brought you know, turning it and turning it over was going to allow more things to be, be nutrition brought to the soil. That's, so what, that, that's what we all thought. So we thought that was it. We know that that's wrong. Now we're coming across the dirt that is uh, uh, in, in the Amazon was manufactured. There's pieces of pottery in it. It's, it's irrefutable, right? Yeah. I mean, they've, yeah. they've now come to this knowledge of okay, how, because I mean, it created all these other bugs, microorganisms yep. that that uh, is now, can that be, is that the same type of dirt that could be brought up here? Is it, it and I don't know. I mean, it's a question. So, so yeah. Who cares if that's if it could be right? But what you're talking about is putting something natural, right? right? This yep. process where it isn't chemicals, right? It's yep. not the 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 answer is not that. So whether we had this knowledge that I'm looking at, you know, we're not innovative. We're kind of going backwards. But at the same time, there's civilizations that we think were uh, antiquated and so stu hunter gatherers and foragers. No, they, they were growing things yeah. and they had a soil that they could grow anything in, yep. right? Yep. And, and, and yep. huge harvest. So, um, so I couldn't leave that yeah. if it's a deviation from where we're going. I, I, I don't think it is. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that's, that we continue to learn about soil and, and, and soil science research is that, that, that we don't know nearly as much as we think we know. Yeah. Um, Interesting. You know, you know the, the, like I said before, is if you take a handful of soil, there's more microbes or life in that one handful of soil than there are people on the earth and in, in healthy soil. And, but, but the interesting thing about this, this black soil, the Amazon soil, yeah. um, is that the microbes that are in that soil might be different than would be in a different biome. So if, yeah. if we look at, um, you know, we, in the North America, we often talk about the oak biome because most of the biome in North America is, and I, a lot of it is, the earth biome. It's the largest biome in the world um, by square miles. And uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of, of Russia that's the oak biome. But basically, it's, it's uh, um, the, the bacterias, the funguses, the, uh, all, all the different, for lack of a better word, critters yeah. that live in the soil. Um, it's different there than it is in, in the Amazon jungle because of environments and what the, the plants are that are growing there. So 
uh, one of the ways that if you, if like let's take my farm, I don't have any oak trees on my farm when I got there. I didn't have anything from an oak biome actually living there. It was the, the only thing that was there was um, these, these Russian olives, right? And so how do we get that, how do we get that biome, the, all the bacterias? Will they get there eventually? Yeah, they will. So they are floating in the wind. There's spores and, and all kinds of stuff just floating in the wind. Eventually there's gonna land some on my farm and, and they're gonna, they're, they're probably already there, some of them. But uh, a faster way to do that is if you go get a handful of soil from the kind of biome that you want to grow and you put it in, just put it around your trees or throw some on, then it gives it a jump start and helps it grow faster because then all of a sudden there's this, uh, um, I don't know, incubator of, of this, these bacterias that are going to help. They're going to flourish. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. The because, because the, the, um, the roots of the different plants that you're going to grow in that biome are all similar. They are, have symbiotic relationships with each other. And so that's why when I said, hey, I'm going to grow apples, elderberries, um, chestnuts, hazelnuts, um, and mulberries, why am I going to grow those? Because those all create the same biome together, and they all work well together. Well, wh what if I put a pine tree in the middle of that? Is that going to grow as well? No, it's a little bit different soil type. It's a different, the bacteria, all the, the funguses and everything that are in the or fungi in the soil are going to be different than the ones that, that I want. So, uh, so anyway, sometimes when you plant, I mean, sometimes when you plant something in your yard, it just doesn't do well, right? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons, not all the reasons, but one of the potential reasons is because the, the stuff that's in the soil isn't the right stuff in the soil to help that particular type of plant grow. And, you know, there's lots of guys that know a lot more about it than I do, but. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I mean, in soil types, I mean, I think I've got uh, parts of my yard I, th I know just have more clay. Yep. And I'm watering it, and I'm trying to figure this out. It's like, but I, I, I put the system in, you know, and it's like, man, I got to, like, redo my system. And, you know, because yeah. I've got a whole line of them. It's like, how do I have, okay, only so many gallons per this head. And, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, it's simply comp very complicated, very complicated, very fast. Yeah, if, yeah. if you want to have, not overwater, right? Yeah. Which is what I've been trying to do. Yeah. And so uh, my, my uh, solution to that has been like, you know, I think I'm going to like pull a lot of this stuff out and just put rocks in like they do down in St. George, you know. Right. But that's not necessarily the look that we want necessarily per se. And, and, and frankly, it may not even be the right way to so save water. Um, there's, there's a... I, and I don't know a lot about this, but I've been doing a little bit of reading about how to um, uh, improve landscapes. And, I, and that's not really my thing. But uh, what I've learned is that sometimes just rocks make it so that you are changing the environment. There wasn't rocks necessarily when, when the pioneers got into Utah County or Utah Valley, right? Um, so if it, we actually want some of that water to evaporate. Now, I'm not saying that that's really what we should be doing necessarily, but... Uh, but it, it's something worth thinking about is, is when we have a lot of different, I think actually planting more things and more variety of different things may be the right answer because that actually will hold more water in the soil, which makes it so you have to water less and actually will help those plants do better and all they'll respirate amount of water into the atmosphere, which will then make it rain more. It'll create these microclimates. Uh, that you know cools down our cities. We put in all this asphalt. We put in all these roofs, and that actually warms the city up. And by cooling the city down, by putting in more plants, I mean, it, it, I think about this all the time. When when the when when pioneers got into Utah, there wasn't any trees, according to I think it was uh, one of the trappers. He said there was like a single tree in all of Utah or all of Salt Lake Valley, right? Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but but that's one of the things that the history books say. And, uh, but now you look at you, uh, Salt Lake Valley or, or Utah Valley and you go, it's just beautiful. It's, there's trees everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think the trees are offsetting all the asphalt and all the roofs and all the other things that are going on. But, um, you know, it's, it's, if, if we could get more, uh, more grass, more, you know, trees, especially, the, 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 the trees don't use as much water. They pull, um, they, they, they 
pull water into them, but they don't aspirate as much water, but they create micro environments. What I mean by that is if there wasn't a tree there at all and it was just bare dirt, you're going to have more water evaporation than through the trees. So um, anyway, yeah, no, it's, it's in, very interesting. interesting right? So, so the house I bought was the, the, yeah. the house that my, my father was raised in. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's, it, it was one of the first homes in Spanish Fork. Yeah. It was built in, and uh, uh, an old Victorian that we've tried to make look more like an old Victorian, you know, at the time that they build it and reclassic that. But then, uh, I mean, we, we really do have, I mean, we've got, I've got several trees that are 50, 60 feet tall. Yeah. Um, one that my grandpa planted when I was a kid, actually, and now it's, it's a pecan tree. It, a huge, yeah. a massive tree right now. And it's like, and I like, keep going, man, you know, but it's, and it does make a difference, right? I mean, we're, we're there in our backyard. I mean, it, it literally is getting to the point that it's, uh, you know, covering a third of the yard at any given moment in the day, you know, you got a place that's 15 shady. degrees less, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. shade's amazing, right? Yeah. In the middle of the summer. And uh, so, so there's that. And, and uh, that's interesting. You said that about that, you know, with, you know, some of the uh, natural things overall and, and, and how to change that. I think, you know, with the grass, well, anyway, I, I, I've got my mind spinning on a couple things there. Um, but um, uh, there's something you said I was going to follow up on. Um, but it was, uh, well, so you see this going, you're, you're experimenting with some of this, right? So, so let me add, okay. That when, when I just was a little dumbfounded of finding out today, yeah. Okay. The, 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 uh, founders of this nation didn't, I mean, the Indians actually, uh, they, they didn't till the soil. They, they didn't till the soil and they yeah. were doing things like, you know, like adding, uh, ash. Yeah. To, to 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 break down the corn, so they knew yeah. these things, right? I mean, yeah. so that means that they were uh, farming it in a different yeah. way, probably all together. Yeah. I've heard some people say, well, maize versus, you know, what our corn is that we grow today is is a different product. Maybe I don't know if that's I mean, true. It's a, it's a relative, but it's, yeah, there, yeah, it's corn, yeah. right? I mean, at the end I mean, of the day, that's a whole other that's a whole other uh, thing to talk about. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, GMOs and what those are and and why GMOs are. Uh, challenging or interesting to think about and what, what they've done. Have you, have you want me to talk about those at all? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I don't know much about it. I do hear people talking about it and how it affects, right? Uh, so what a GMO stands for. So gen genetically modified, um, organism. Yeah. Which I always hear people talk about that with wheat mostly, right? Yeah. Is it, is it everything? So there's, there's lots of, well, there's lots of GMOs. Uh, corn is the first was one of the big ones. Mm. Um, there's two different ways to, to, well, genetically modified means you're actually changing the DNA of that particular organism. So it's a different organism. Now, how do you do that? I, I, I always thought, well, maybe they get it under a microscope and, and manipulate some, uh, some DNA and, and then they figure out how to grow that one. Well, what I learned recently, uh, is reading, doing some reading about, you know, really what is a GMO and they actually use a virus, an e, I believe it's uh, E. coli or um, salmonella, I can't remember which one it is, a uh, virus that, uh, or bacteria that uh, um, th to change the, um, the cell structure of a, of a plant. And so they inject a different type, uh, I'm getting confused here maybe, uh, and anyway, it's a, it's a, is it a virus or a bacteria? I can't remember which one it is, but anyway, uh, and they modify the, uh, the genetics of that particular plant, uh, using the, uh, an invas they, they invade the, the cell of the first plant of the original plant, uh, using this virus. And, um, when that happens, it actually changes uh, the plant into a completely different plant that may or may not, uh, it might, may be good, may be bad, uh, but they really don't know all of the things that it did to the plant. And so it could cause all kinds of issues. Uh, could be good, could be bad. Um, and I'm not, I'm not a scientist, a genetic scientist or anything like that, but uh, uh, it's interesting to think about when you genetically modify something uh, to make it so that it um, that it doesn't absorb or that it doesn't die when it absorbs poison. 
I mean, that's what most of these genetically modified plants are. Uh, they're genetically modified to resist this particular type of poison so that you can spray the plants and it kills the weeds. Or you can spray the plants for bugs and it kills the bugs but doesn't kill the plant. Or, uh, you know, they're, but, they're, but they have but genetically... But it's that poison to the end product. P potentially. Potentially. Yeah, yeah. So is that a lot of the debate of what it's that's what it's all about? Route? Yeah, yep. And so you you've got um, this this plant that is not something that we were eating ten years ago. It's something that's completely different. How and, how far back does that go? Are we talking um, ten fifteen years is all? It's the I, my recollection is the nineties. Hmm. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just it's just fascinating to think we don't even have enough information yet. To, to, to know what it's going to do to us uh, because, you know, but, but it's a, certainly a gamble. Um, but we're in lock, stock, and barrel, right? We're, we're, we're all in. We're right? all in. Yeah. We, we've taken all those chips and, like, we're all in. We're playing this hand out, right? I mean, because that's everywhere, right? I mean, yeah. isn't that what – I mean, yeah. nobody's holding back on that. Well, there are some people that are. Uh, there's, still, well, so, there's, yeah. there's still a significant uh, number of acres that are planted with non-GMO products. You know the both the organic revolution and the you know the okay. stay yeah. away from GMO stuff. That there's there are some you know native and um, uh, forgot the word uh, normal natural uh, plants out there still that haven't been genetically modified. Now that's completely different than uh, than creating a a new plant species through natural selection. So. You know, we talk about, um, well, let's talk about potatoes. Um, I, I do, I work a lot with potatoes. So the russet, uh, the russet potato um, that we, we grow lots of in Idaho, right? Um, why did that, why does that um, potato exist? Well, because in the, the potato famine of, of the, what was it, the 19, 1880s or whatever it was, uh, the Burbank potatoes, uh, the, he went and uh, planted potatoes from seed. Now, do we plant potatoes from seed? No. When's the last time you, you never even heard that? You didn't even know the seeds existed on potatoes, right? right? Nope. Well, what happens is you get a potato plant, it grows, it grows flowers, and then it grows a seed. If you plant that seed, you get a different variety of potato, a potato that's never been, you've never seen it before. It's a completely new potato. And in nature, that's how things work. And the, the ones that don't taste good or the ones that don't deal well with the bacteria or the viruses or the diseases or the fungus or whatever the problem is that year, they die. And the ones that do well, they survive. And so it normally, you know, it just naturally modifies the, the type of potato or the type of plant through natural selection because the ones that live are the ones that deal well with the environments and the bacterias and the bugs and the whatever of that particular time. Well, we took a potato. So once upon a time, way back then, there was a guy that went and planted a whole bunch of seeds. And he found a potato that wasn't dying from the potato plague. And he went and then took that potato, the potatoes, the tubers, cut them in pieces and started growing plants from those, then took those, cut them in pieces, they're genetically identical for, to the original potato. If you look at all, like the apple trees, you look at your, uh, your Golden Delicious or your, your um, uh, Macintosh apples, you know, that apple tree is genetically identical to the one that was planted in 1780. You know, Mr. Macintosh that found this great apple in the, out in the forest he, he, he found this awesome apple. He's like, this is the best tasting apple I've ever had. I'm going to go and graft that onto another apple tree, and I'm going to take little twigs, and I'm going to graft them onto all these apple trees. They're genetically identical to the apple, apple tree in, hmm. in 17 whatever. I never thought about that, actually, so, that apple tree. Yeah, that apple tree. They're the same tree. Wow. And okay. uh, what, what does that mean? That that hasn't genetically changed to deal with all of the challenges of today. Is the world different today than it was in 1780? Sure it is. There's more yeah. pollution. There's different types of pollution. There's different types of bugs. These bugs didn't stop genetically changing. The bugs are getting smarter and getting better and getting yeah. bigger every single day, right? They're yeah. changing at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, but we have the same apple tree that we had 
200 years ago. So it hasn't genetically changed to be able to deal with the environment of today. So what do we need to do? We need to plant, I'm, I'm gonna go plant 4,000 apple seeds and see if any of those grow and see if, they're, if, if, they, if they deal well with today's environment and if they taste good. So they gotta taste good, right? Well, what kind of apple tree am I gonna have? I don't know, I'm gonna have Bob's apple tree. You know, who knows? <laughs> it's, it's gonna be an apple tree that's gonna taste good and it's gonna grow in Lakeshore, that's the goal. You know, it's gonna grow in a high water table environment, which a lot of apple trees don't wanna do. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of what regenerative agriculture is about. And that's what we're doing at our farm and we're having you know, a good time doing it. We're wanting lots of people to come out and help us and help us plant trees. And we want grade school kids to plant all their apple, uh, all the seeds that they get out of their apple at lunchtime. We want them to plant those and we okay. want them to bring was, them out to our farm. And that was my plant. question I was just gonna ask. So, so let's say uh, we get, um, so, we have a, my grandpa had two large places that are, there was a garden, right? And I've only, uh, he actually sold the one, uh, so it's not part of the, the ground, yeah. which is a good thing because it was, you know, <laughs> I, there was like this expectation that I was going to do the garden that he had, which is about one third or, you know, um, uh, a very small garden. That we yeah. Had. My wife <clears throat> started taking all the seeds yeah. out of whatever we were even if we went to the farmer's market bottom yeah. Right, yeah. and uh, uh, a bunch of different peppers that we had. And I don't know where these peppers came. So we planted them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're different. I mean, we've had a little different, right? I mean, yeah. it's, there's a spaghetti squash. It, it was a little, there were some things that came. Is yeah. that, is that with the seed coming out of it? It's not same genetic. It's not the same genetics. It got, it got fertilized by something else. So it's a different, it's a different so, kind. So if I get it from burpees, right? They, yeah. they sell me the seed. Or mm -hmm. Is that something different? Or have so, they got something that's... So I don't know exactly how they do it, but they are, are very careful to produce a certain type of seed and, and make them so that they're... They call them heirloom, heirloom seeds, um, meaning that they are genetically similar enough to call them the same thing. So Predictable. If, you know, you go and buy a, a zucchini squash and... Uh, you plant it in your garden and next to it you plant your pumpkin and so then you take your pumpkin seed and you're going hey this was a great pumpkin this was a great zucchini squash you go plant those seeds and now the next year your zucchini squash has orange skin and is really thick and your pumpkin doesn't grow very big and it's got green stripes on it right mm -hmm. that's what always happens well it's because we planted those two together and they cross pollinated um I, I don't know all the ways that they can t continue Very to make heirloom, interesting. heirloom So seeds, that is a real thing. Yeah, for sure. So the last couple of years that my wife has done that, and we're ended up with this thing that's uh, some peppers that were, I mean, they were a little longer, yep. right? Like, yep. like it looks like an Anaheim, but it's even skinnier. Yep. And, and I'm like, we did not plant that, right? Yeah. Uh, for sure. And it was, uh, so I chopped them up and I've been made, and she kept all the seeds. So yeah. she's got all these different seeds yeah. and she's going to do it again. And yep. I'm, I've been very intrigued to see. So, uh, yeah, so very interesting. <laughs> This is, this is actually, it's amazing. So, so, so I'm at a, a nursery, right? Mm -hmm. This one at first, uh, I was, uh, I've always liked flowering plum trees. Yep. Just the color, and, yep. you know, but my dad's like, don't buy them. They're going to end up splitting, you know, you're going to, yeah. you know, you don't want those. But anyway, I was, I was talking to the guy. He's like, nah, you know, he said, if you prune them right and you do this, that, and he said, but look, they're all, they're all uh, clones. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean clone? He said, they're all, the, he said, stand back and look at them. And there was like 30 of them. Yep. Right, and the branches were coming out, and you could see where some had been like had a branch busted or something. Right, mm -hmm. it was the same tree. It blew me away actually, and I I thought oh, that is, and, and of course they had made it so that it didn't grow the plum. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yep. it, it, it flowered. It did all the other stuff. I think it flowered, but but there was not going to be a fruit. Right, right, right. Um, and I've heard some people say, well, the, it, it cross pollinated with you know like so maybe some of these things, so it, it wasn't supposed to. But it did grow. And so I'm like, well, that, that's a little weird. I don't know. You know, it's beyond my, my understanding of why that would work. But I remember, I mean, that's been the last 20 years, you know, when I saw that. So and the so, guy pointed that out. And I thought, that's very interesting. We've got this tree. And it's a decorative. I mean, yeah. they, they were selling it. It wasn't yeah. for fruit. It wasn't right. to grow or harvest right. or anything. So I thought, nah, that's okay. But there was something in the back of my mind. It kind of like, man, we just keep manipulating these things to where it's like, what is the benefit of doing that so we don't have plums that drop on the sidewalk? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe is that a benefit? So could be some for, right? for sure. I mean, <laughs> there's that's not that's not that's natural variation. 
in okay. it, by by getting a seed and planting a seed and seeing what happens. That's natural variation. That's not GMO. Now okay. your quality might be terrible. Yeah. You know these two thousand apple trees or whatever number of thousands of apple trees I'm going to plant. Probably, I mean statistically speaking, nine hundred ninety nine of them will be garbage. <laughs> But you mean that they might grow and not even produce fruit or something too, or they, they might get sick, they might split, they might their food the the fruit might be terrible, the fruit might be small, the fruit might a whole variety of things. But you know when we talk about that, they might be just not tasty. But just within the last five years, <coughs> I uh, so I have peach trees and nectarine trees in my backyard. You have what? Peach trees and nectarine trees. Okay. So my wife, my wife likes to can peaches. Yeah. So we no. grow a whole bunch of, of uh, peach trees. And I like nectarines. I, I, I prefer to eat nectarines because I just, they don't have to peel them. And, and I like that flavor, that zing that you get from a nectarine, right? So uh, I needed another tree. And, and I noticed that one came up. A, a, a seed had come up. I was like, hey, I'm not going to cut that one down. I'm just going to, like, keep it going. And... <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they just don't produce fruit. Right. But, um, uh, this particular one produced and I was like, huh, that it, it produced one. So we'll let it keep growing. And it turns out that that particular tree produces a, what we call a peacherine. It tastes a lot like a peach, but it has the skin of a nectarine and it grows really big. It's super juicy and it uh, you harvest it at just the right time and it, it stores really, really well. So I can, I can pick the, these peacherines and I can put them in the fridge and I can have them in the fridge for months and they're still fantastic and they taste fantastic right off the tree. I eat like as fast as I can eat them all day long when they're, when they're in season. But, um, what are the odds? I don't know. But it, the first one, the first, the first one I ended up uh, planting or the first seed that came up, it worked for me, but you know, People that have a PhD uh, in in this might would sit, would tell me, well, the odds of that are one in a thousand, and maybe that's true, um, and and I'm just going to go with it. So I'm going to plant a whole bunch of apples and see if I get the various kinds. No. Not worried about what not, you, not have the kids save. Yep. The, the, the yep. the seeds. The seed in the apple. Yep. And uh, and 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 then plant them. Yep. We're going to plant them. We want to do that with lots of different types of uh, of. of trees and see if we get ones that work <laughs> okay so i've got to say this just because it you know we had uh apricot yeah. an apricot yeah and, and my my dad said cut, cut that down you know right yeah he would go when my grandma was there and he'd help you know and I, i'd go with him sometimes but they'd always just like give me a bucket and hey go plant yeah. go pick the stuff that's ready out there yeah. right <laughs> and this is like when i'm in my 30s you know i'd go down there to help her and do stuff like that but this uh, apricot tree came up. My dad said, hey, oh, that's a, what do they call it? When it's like a starter, you know, like. From, yeah, it's a sucker or whatever. Yeah. And he's like, cut it, cut it down. It's not going to yeah. be good. And I said, you know, I, I kind of like where the tree's at. You yeah. Know, just like, you know, the yeah. neighbor, it kind of blocks that one little yeah. thing right there and it's grown. I was pruning it yeah. as if it was going to bear fruit and yeah. I was trying to keep it low. Yeah. And uh, uh, two, three years ago, it started. So we've been there 12 years yeah. in the house. It started to produce. And it, and it was a. a it wasn't the same as the other apricot, which I, you know, I don't know yeah. where that came from, but it, but it, it, it comes on a little bit later. Yeah. It's bigger. Uh -huh. Right. So, and I thought, well, it must just be a different apricot, which it probably it, it's it is something. Well, right? it, it, it has to be because it's not a genetic clone. It, it's not a clone. So it yeah. is. So it's interesting. So yeah. it's, a, and every year it's produced not as much as the other tree. Um, yeah. Uh, but it has every year, you know, and it's been pretty good. And I think it's actually a little resistant to the, uh, the bugs because the yeah. other one will get like every, like so many years, no matter if we spray it or not, yep. it'll get yeah, the, know, the beetle the, or the yep. worm or the, I don't know what it is in there, but, um, it kind of mess up the whole, you know, the, crop. Yeah. The, the boar the, that just, and, yeah. and so there's that. And then, and then, uh, out of nowhere in the middle of this garden, which I was like, Hey, anyway, I had that app, right. I yeah. can take a picture and it was a white mulberry Love tree. Them. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it just, I mean, it was growing. I mean, it was like really taken off. And, uh, and I said, Hey, did, did you guys ever grow a mulberry tree? And, and, uh, I don't know where this thing was. I mean, if they just kept like whacking it, you yeah. know, yeah. down, but when I, uh, I, I thought it was right close to one of my, uh, red delicious. Yeah. And it's, it was too close. Right. And so I'm going to transplant this thing. Yeah. 
So I let it grow that one year. It got up, you know, kind of big, and I, I go dig down, and it's got this root, man. I mean, it goes, it, it, you know, it's like that big, and it goes out, trunks out in a couple. So, I mean, it's, it's made it, right? I mean, yeah. it's like, I thought, well, you know what? I'm, I've almost hacked this thing, right? I mean, I, I dug yeah. down as far as I could, transplanted it uh, last year, yeah. right? So this year, summer, it came up, and it didn't thrive, yeah. but it's there. I mean, yeah. it made it, right? It's yeah, good. good. And so I'm interested to see. I don't even know if I've ever eaten a mulberry. They're the best things you've ever had. Really? Oh, my goodness. What, what's it close to? What's it similar? I mean, I'm... Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like a raspberry and a cherry kind of stuck together. Really? Um, they, you know, white mulberries. So I lived in Turkey for three years, Ankara, Turkey, and uh, we had mulberry trees, and they would dry the white mulberries. You shake them off, and then you dry them, and they taste like candy. So dried mulberries are just to die for they're they're so sweet they have their sugar content are they just, white they're not they're, white. they're white well they have white ones and red ones or black ones and uh the the downside to mulberries is they drop by the millions and make a mess and so people got rid of mulberries and they got rid of them out of little parks and everything because they make a mess right but they're a fruit that's about an inch long maybe uh, if it's a some of them are inch and a half even two inches long and uh maybe a half inch across and uh they're they're a lot like a kind of like a raspberry with, with a little strand in the middle of them but you can eat the strand you just pick the whole stem and everything throw the stem and everything in your mouth and it, it they're fantastic very interesting yeah i mean i so it hasn't borne fruit yet you yeah. know but it will probably right i'm guessing i hope so i hope so too if it's it, if it's a white mulberry those are uh they're 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 phenomenal yeah. Some down there. Yeah. Get some harvest yeah. off of them. I've got, I, I, I planted uh, five uh, black mulberries this year down at the farm. Um, I need to get some. Next year, we're going to bring in, um, you know, a whole bunch of whites and black mulberries that are a foot tall. And, Is it a hardy tree? Pretty hardy tree? Uh, it, grows, it grows in the Utah area, yeah. you know, so, it you know, it's a, I think it's a nine, something like that. Um, the U.S. Um, climate meter, which is pretty hardy. So, okay. So that's how you're doing it. You've got, I mean, that's how you're going to, I mean, you're taking, so, so one, one last thing. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of coming down to that little time period here yeah. and I, we've got to, we've got to maybe button some things down. Um, there's additional acreage. Are you still wanting to try to acquire that? Is there, you, you need uh, uh, to do what you're trying to do because you have a day job. You've got all these other things. you got, a, you got a family. Yep. You got all the other things that it's like, how is he doing this? Right. I mean, that's what I think. Start yeah. thinking. It's like, Man, how, you know, it's like, I can't even get to have stuff. This is a, uh, I like that you turn to the community, right? As you were talking about, it's like, hey, we're going to get all the kids to save their apple yeah. seeds, and yeah. then we're going to save these other things, and and uh, uh, so pull from that. What what what, what can we do? And, and, and I'll get all the other information to tie to your other social media things and posts, and people can go yeah. directly at you with this. Um, I, I think this is one that will kind of like uh, the nice thing when you do put it out on YouTube, it's forever there. Yeah. And I've talked to some other, I think this will take some uh, uh, better traction even down the road. Yeah. Right. So this yeah. is one of those things. Yeah. How, how can uh, people serve you or help? I, I'm going to reach out. I've got some different yeah. investors maybe to buy that land. Is that, is that still a play? Ab or is that absolutely. So we, we have 50 acres. We can do what we want on the 50 acres, but we want to get an additional 20 acres. That's right next door to us. Um, because we don't want it to be developed. We want to continue to grow the, the community of, of local farming. We want to be able to do more than we, than we can with 50 acres. You know, getting this 20 acres would, would be a, a big help to us, and I think it would be a great investment opportunity for uh, people who want to invest in the farm. Uh, we're going to have, you know, all kinds of social activities at the farm to teach uh, and, and fun events at the farm. Uh, everything from military related stuff to farm related stuff. We're already doing these, these pet and feeds where people come out and pet the highlands. They, people love to see and pet the highlands, learn where beef comes from, learn about where food comes from. Um, but we want, we want people to come and interact with the farm. So we need a, a whole group of volunteers to help us with all kinds of different things. If you, if you're, you or your family want to come out and, and learn about farming and actually do some work on a farm, you want to shovel something, 
whether it's hay or poop, there's things like that to do, but there's also uh, trees to be trimmed. There's um, things to be harvested. There's pipe that needs to get put in the ground. Are you eradicating the, the Russian olives? Eventually, to eventually we're going to eradicate the Russian olives. Yep. But we don't want to do that until the, the cows like, like eating them. So hmm. uh, until, until we get uh, a different, remember those, uh, micro, those micro environments that we're building? The Russian olives do that, and they actually allow the, the uh, things to grow in between them. And, and so we like those until we get other trees to replace them. So we're going to keep them pruned and keep sure. them, you know. But, uh, yeah, we, we, want, we want help, and we want to uh, have people come and learn with us. And uh, we're actually looking for uh, farmers that want to be farmers to come and help, uh, you know, where we do a, a revenue split of some sort for people that want to run the, the aginators or the, yeah. the chicken tractors or, you know, if someone wanted to milk goats or, dare, or, or cows or something that they wanted to do it, if, as long as they fit into the profile of wanting to do it through a regenerative method, you know, we're, we're you know, open to those kinds of, of opportunities. So That's awesome. And where I have lost the one video at this point, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I debated on plugging that in or not. It normally will go two hours. We made it about an hour and 45 minutes, so I apologize. But um, I want to have you back. We'll do some other things here, and, and obviously uh, your World War II or other... Uh, I, I, did, I didn't see your... Was your tank down there that day? The tank was not down there okay, that day. I didn't think yeah, I was, we're, we're, but I went in there, and I was like, there were several other really cool things, and I was like, okay, there's a half track, but I'm not sure what... Yeah. You, know, I, you know, some of these things that are just... Uh, that takes uh, work and effort as well. It does. Right? Yeah, we have a, a, every Thursday night we get together for tank night. Right now we're putting new engines in a 1943 M5 Stewart. Um, so that's M5 Stewart. Is that what it was? What's the name of it? M5 Stewart. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's an I, M5A1. Uh, yeah, built in 43. Um, so it's it's a fun project that we're working on. Uh, we're putting a, um, a Chevy engine in it rather than a Cadillac engine in it. Um, It'll give it a little bit more power and a lot easier maintenance. And then we're going to have the Cadillac engines on display next to it so that people can see what was really, during the war, what would have powered it. But every night, Thursday night, that's what we do. <laughs> very so. cool. Thank you, Vernon. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate Thank you very much.